Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we're gathered together. And so you said, whenever we gather in his name, you'll be present. It's your presence that we look right now. And we pray, God, that you would give us open ears, ears of the heart, to hear your voice, to hear truth with your authority, with your power, with your life. God, speak to us and enable us to glorify you with our lives. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone agreeing said amen. Amen. Did I hear that right? Amen. Amen. Yes and amen. Good. All right. Wonderful. So, offering myself. That's a challenge. Solomon, the fifth and youngest son of Bathsheba and King David, was only about 20 years old when his father handed him the throne of all Israel. And as if that wasn't challenge enough, David also commissioned him with building a grand temple to the living God, the God above all other gods. Now thinking ahead, David provided Solomon with all the materials he would need for such an immense task, stone, wood, gold, silver, fabric, because as he told Solomon, every part of this plan was given to me in writing from the hand of the Lord. Now Solomon could see the materials his father had gathered and stockpiled and ready for his use, but there was so much more that was needed that could not be seen. Can you relate to that? Who would perform the work? Who would craft the furniture? Who would forge the metals and pound them into shape? Surely not Solomon himself, while governing the people and leading the army at the same time. And who would staff the services of the temple once it was completed? Raising the necessary livestock, preparing and offering the sacrifices, keeping the fires burning and all the supplies in stock. Then David told his son, Be strong and courageous, and do the work. Listen to that again. Be strong and courageous, and do the work. Don't be afraid or discouraged. Frankly, I've needed those words many times. Don't be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. He will see to it that all the work related to the temple of the Lord is finished correctly. The various divisions of priests and Levites will serve in the temple of God. Others with skills of every kind will volunteer, and the officials and the entire nation are at your command. Now that's the answer that Solomon needed. God would be with him, And the community of people would volunteer at his command. It takes both, doesn't it? I mean, we need God to be with us, but we also need the people to work with us. God and the people. God will not do the works required in our world directly. He doesn't stretch a hand down out of the clouds and make things happen. He works through people. And the people cannot accomplish the great task before them without the help of the Almighty. Right. We need His help. Even sometimes in the little things. And here's what we know. God will do His part. He is faithful. Faithful you are. We sang it today. Faithful you are. He has pledged himself to it. God will do his part, but will we? I once heard a story based on common experience that addresses this question. This is a story about four people. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. 
Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have. Okay. No. <laughs> David told Solomon, others with skills of every kind will volunteer. That's what he told him. What a great prediction that was. What joyous news to a leader's ears. Everybody with all kinds of skills will volunteer. During the period of the judges, Deborah, a judge, and Barak, the captain of her army, sang this song of victory. When the leaders lead in Israel, when the people volunteer, praise the Lord. Amen. I want to sing it again for you. When the leaders lead in Israel and the people volunteer, Amen. praise the Lord. <laughs> That's victory indeed. It's a cause for celebration. Now the psalmist broadened the scope of expectation beyond buildings and battles. Here's what he said, your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. That's Psalm 110, verse 3. Your people, O God, will volunteer freely in the day of your power. You see, volunteerism is characteristic of the kingdom of heaven that's come to us through Jesus Christ, because this is the day of his power. The Holy Spirit now dwells among us in the church. Paul said, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Listen to it once again. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So the power of the Holy Spirit has come. The kingdom of heaven is here. And God has prepared beforehand the opportunity of our good works. But do we walk in them as he intended? We believe the truth. We've received the life. And we're now in the way. Or... Are we just in the way Amen. while others are wearing themselves out trying to do their job and ours for us? Jesus' 12 disciples were volunteers. He didn't hire a single one of them. He said to them, follow me. They were responsible to support themselves along the way. Paul sewed tents, as did Aquila and Priscilla. Looking at the church of Jesus Christ, we see the same thing today. There are 3,260,000 adherents of Assemblies of God churches across the United States today and 37,700 ministers. That means that 99% of those people who are active in Assemblies of God churches are lay people, non-professional volunteers who staff and teach our small groups, our Sunday schools, our children's churches, our boys and girls ministries, our worship teams, our media teams, men's and women's groups, prison and hospital visitation teams, food collection and delivery, and a hundred other tasks that round out the church's ministries. Even those who receive pay for their ministry skills usually volunteer many extra hours every week to see people reached and discipled and sent out. That's just the way it is. Volunteerism is the fuel on which local churches run. Because Jesus has said, freely you have received, now freely give. What have you freely 
received. We've received mercy. God has forgiven all our sins, all our iniquities, all our rebellion, all our stiff-heartedness. Mercy. We've received grace abundantly. That's help from God when we need it, whether we know it or not. Grace helps us. We've received courage, the boldness of faith in Christ, because I am confident in Him, in what He's capable of, in what He's promised to do, in His presence and in His purpose. We have courage. We've received wisdom. He said, if you lack it, ask. I'll give it abundantly, liberally, generously. And he won't be cranky about it. Wisdom, guidance from the Lord. Have you ever needed that? He gives it. What have we received freely from him? How about provision? Pastor Tim prayed about that today. It's what we need and what we need to give away from the Lord. He provides what we need and then some. What have we received freely from him? How about your health? And don't don't let your mind stray now to all the problems physically that you feel and have from day to day because in spite of all of them, we are healthier than most people on the planet. He gives us health. He who is life dwells consistently inside of you and is constantly working and healing and protecting you. What have we freely received from him? Power. The power of an endless holy life. The power to live beyond ourselves and above our selfish desires. Power to live and to serve him. What have we freely received? Truth. Truth. In a world of lies and manipulations, we've received truth, the personal knowledge of Almighty God. You may not know everything that's true, and you may not presently discern everything that's true or false, but we know the one who is true and faithful. What have we freely received? How about life? The indwelling presence. I don't mean just (gasps) pumping blood existing, but the life, the presence of Almighty God dwelling in you every day. He wakes up within you when you open your eyes. We were talking the other night, in uh, Tuesday night, in our study of Matthew, the story of of uh, the disciples and Jesus in the boat crossing the lake and then the storm suddenly comes up and threatens to capsize them, drown them all and they're in a panic and Jesus is sleeping in the boat. And finally they're beside themselves and they come and wake him up and say, Master, don't you care? We're dying! And he stands up and he speaks to the wind and to the waves, peace, be still, and everything goes... And then he turns to them and he says, why are you afraid? You men of little faith. The presence of God. He's always in your boat. He's always in your boat. If he doesn't seem to be active, wake him up. (laughs) Best way I know how is begin to worship him. Begin to praise him. You'll catch his ear. So all of these things are what God has freely given to us. Mercy, grace, courage, wisdom, provision, health, power, truth, and life. Now of this, what are you giving away? God's given you so much. What are you giving away? What are you passing on to other people. See, that's what volunteering is all about. 
It's a way of gratefully acknowledging what Jesus Christ has placed in our hands by passing it on to others. According to Eugene Peterson, the message, Paul wrote to the church in Rome, chapter 12, these words. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. What do you think about that? Not just your so-called spiritual life. Not just your religious life. Not just your church life. But the whole of your life. The ordinariness of your life. The everydayness of your life. Place it before the Lord as an offering. What would happen on your Monday if you start the day by placing this Monday before the Lord? What would happen on Tuesday? You get the picture? Volunteering is the way to place yourself before God as an offering. It's what transforms your life, your everyday life, into a fragrant gift of thanks to the Savior. Saying the words thank you are important. Send a card to somebody who's been good to you. Give them a call. At least write them a text and acknowledge their kindness. But the words thank you are never enough. They're never enough, especially toward God. They're not even enough for you. How many of you have heard the words thank you and thought to yourself, sure. Like you really meant it. If they were enough, then Jesus would only need, have needed to say from heaven, I love you, instead of hanging on a cross in our place. Words are never enough. Volunteering is a way of saying thank you to the Lord. Volunteering is the way you discover your spiritual gifts and cultivate your Christian skills. Spiritual gifts are not discovered in a vacuum. You can't find them by reading a book or taking a test. You will find your spiritual gifts by serving in love, by volunteering. Spiritual gifts are not discovered in a vacuum. They're found in the context of need. Here's what I mean. 1 Corinthians 12, which is all about the spiritual gifts of the body of Christ, ends with a challenge. The challenge reads like this. You only want the better gifts. How many times I've talked to people who read through the list of the nine supernatural gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, and they say, oh, speaking in other tongues, it's the last on the list. I guess it's not that important. Like any supernatural gift is not important. The list is not a priority list. The list is not a ranking of gifts. If you had nine gifts to describe, what makes any one of them more important than the other? The context of need. If I need healing... Your prophecy will not benefit me. If I need a word of wisdom, your speaking in tongues will not help. But if I need the presence of God, please pray in tongues and unlock his presence. The value of the gifts is according to the context of the need. We all hope to have gifts, and if we get to choose, we want the best gifts. And Paul said, that's the problem. You only want what you think are the better gifts. Okay, let me take you back a little bit. Bert Bacharach wrote a love song that Dusty Springfield made famous in the year 1964. 
I realize that's before some of you could go back that far. <laughs> the song was called Wishing and Hopin', and it begins with these lines, wishing and hopin' and thinking and praying, planning and dreaming each night of his charms. That won't get you into his arms. The message is clear, I think. Real love takes more than just mental effort and dreamy activity. Bacharach's answer is, show him that you care. Show him that you care. I think it applies to Jesus. You've got to show him that you love him by loving his children and others in his name, by offering your life, your everyday walking about, sleeping and eating life as an offering to him. That's what Paul was saying too. The final verse of 1 Corinthians 12 is this. You only want the better gifts, but I will show you the best thing to do. You're looking for the best gifts. I'm going to show you the best thing to do. And from there he launches into chapter 13, the love chapter, because loving others is the way to discover and develop your spiritual gifts. Don't wait for the Holy Spirit to meet you in some imagined cataclysmic experience of impartation. Just start loving needy people. Hello? Do you know any needy people? Start loving needy people. Don't wait to travel to some far darkened corner of the world. Start loving the needy people around you today. Volunteering Christ's love is the way to discover your gifts and cultivate your skills as a follower of Jesus. Spiritual gifts are discovered in the context of need. Just as John wrote to us, God has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. It's a command. You don't have to wonder about it. It's a command. Do it. How? How do you obey that command? Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. How do you do it? Does it show? Can Jesus see it? Does he know that you are loving other people in his name? Can anyone else see it? Not that it should be done for others to see, only that it should be tangible so that others could see it. So we start with verses 4 through 7 of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, where he wrote these words, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love isn't jealous. It doesn't sing its own praises. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't think about itself. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep track of wrongs. It isn't happy when injustice is done, but it's happy with the truth. Love never stops being patient, never stops believing, never stops hoping, never gives up. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. And when you've actually done all of those, then you will know what else to do. Sometimes we read that list and it just seems so ordinary, you know, be patient, be kind, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's how, how we respond to it, yada, 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 of course, I got that. I mean, but what really do you want me to do, Lord? No, really, be patient and kind at the same time. <laughs> really, 
love your brothers and sisters. There's never a lack of need for love. And there's never a lack of supply of God's gifts to empower us for it. If only we understand how they work together. This afternoon, we're going to celebrate those among us who have recently answered the call to serve others in love through the church in a variety of ways and opportunities. And I hope that you all will stay for lunch to celebrate our volunteers with us. So let me conclude with this final thought. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the lamentations of the book of Psalms. As the songwriters poured out their hearts about the violence and the wickedness that surrounded them. About the weakness and the selfishness within them. The Psalms, in fact, put words to many of our feelings and they give voice to our inward cries. Things that we find difficult to express articulately apart from their help. And the Psalms encourage us to bear our souls before God, to place our life before Him, our everyday up and down life as an offering of thanks. The Psalms give us words with which to pray. They give voice to our innermost feelings. They encourage us to be frank with God who cares about us and listens to us when we pray. And the scriptures further encourage us to share our burdens with one another, with friends or family that we trust, and not to carry them alone. Please hear those last words. The scriptures encourage us not to carry our burdens alone. Take it to the Lord in prayer and find someone or ask him to show you someone with whom you can share your burden. But did you know this? The most tragic laments in the Bible are the ones that God himself expressed. I mean, with whom can God share his burdens? Who could shoulder his load of grief? In case you think that God is above it all, doesn't feel anything, think again. He grieves over our misbehaviors, over our mistrust. Well, here's one of those laments from God that's particularly apropos today as God spoke from the pen of Isaiah. You can read the words on the screen with me. The time for redemption had arrived. I looked around for someone to help. No one. I couldn't believe it. Not one volunteer. So I went ahead and did it myself. <laughs> Those are the Holy Spirit-inspired words from the prophet's pen. I get that. But it could have been me that wrote that numerous times. You don't have to be God to identify with the anguish of such carelessness and helplessness. Every friend, every spouse, every parent, every leader can remember a time when help was desperately needed, when there was no more time to wait, when action was required, an action for which you were not prepared or equipped in the time when you were already exhausted and in need of rest. And yet, it had to be done. That's what God says. Time for redemption had arrived. I mean, it was time. The fullness of time had come. There's no one. There's not one volunteer. Okay. So he rolls up his sleeves and he does it himself. What was to be done? 
The time was now, not later, not someday. Everything was arranged. Everything was in place. But there was no one else to help. It had to be done, and it had to be done now. If only there was a volunteer. But there was none. You've been there. So you did it yourself. Already wearied, ill-equipped, better done by two, but there weren't two. So you did it yourself. God redeemed us by himself. There was not a single effort of mankind on which he relied or could rely. There was no one even interested in saving themselves, let alone the world, in the way that God required. There was no human capable of helping him. There was no angel sufficient to the task. God did it. God himself did it. God became a man and bore the weight of our sin took the stroke of our judgment for our sakes and in our place. Then, when it was done, then he made us capable. Listen to me. He made us capable. He canceled our debt of sin. He washed away our guilt and shame. He gave us his own Holy Spirit He gave us a new birth. He placed us in the family of God, the church. And he said, there's still work to be done. Enter into my labors with me. Work while it is day, while you have light. And today he looks for a man, for a woman, for a young person, for an old person, for an available person, for a volunteer. God is looking for volunteers. And all he requires from you is your availability. He'll give you everything else you need for the job. If only you're available and you will trust him for the supply, whether it's the inward supply or the outward supply. He promises to equip you if you answer his call. He promises to be with you wherever he leads you. He promises to empower you if you will do what he asks. His people will volunteer freely in the day of his power. This is that day. Now is that time. It could be you. Is it you? Will it be you? Let's pray.